I came up this valley nine years before it was bought and said I want to do my project here. It was going to be a completely different project and I would be imposing my ideas on the project. It didn't, wasn't a good one. I've dreamt about this sort of thing happening close to these hills for a long time. And I love these hills. One of the first things we formulated, we were, <coughs> since we were road protesters, that we wanted to make sure that we didn't all have a car, a starter. We shared a vehicle and that um, it was going to be possible to live a, a life with, without having the, the, the surplus consumerism. It's really important to me that I live a life that is, um, that is minimum impact, you know, that, is, that I hardly leave any trace, you know, that's really important. I did have a regular job once, I worked as a diamond value for De Beers, I got paid shitloads of money. I used to have Christmas parties at the Dorchester Hotel. You know, I used to get 10% of what I earned in a year as a Christmas bonus. I got a suit made by Moss Boss. Okay, and then, and then uh, I, I did the job because I didn't know what else to do after leaving school, you know, so I did it for like six years. As a community, we have to work quite closely with each other because to work on the land, I think you, you need to help each other, you know, you need to. Uh, the work can be tough when you're not using power tools, <laughs> so you you have to form quite a strong bond, um, and in that you have to you have to learn how to be with other people. You have to learn how to work effectively as a group. Before I was at Tinker's Bubble, I was working in the games industry. I came from a fairly normal background of going to school and college studied computer science at university and got a decent grade and then started working in the video games industry and rose to become a lead programmer in a company and earning quite a decent salary. Um, but at some point um, during the Iraq war someone showed me some graphs of peak oil and I started realising that we were running out of oil and that it was going to have a huge impact on us combined with what I already knew about climate change, uh, just realised that I'd have to change. Um, so I set about thinking for a few years, trying to save some money, to have a bit of savings before I set off, and finally left my company, set off to go volunteering on farms, um, and on my way found myself to Tinker's Bubble. En route, many of the farms had been saying, oh, there's no way you can do without fossil fuels, you need some for a transition to a fossil fuel free world, oh no no it's pointless. Um, but then when I came here there was a different mentality and people were already living without fossil fuels and managing the land that way. I don't regret anything I've done in my life, it's just a journey, okay? quit my job and I went travelling for three years and that was the end of my life really, because I just couldn't have enough of it. And I wanted to try something alternative, I'm really interested in alternative things, you know. And um, I decided this year, in 2014, was going to be my year because I'd had um, I'd had uh, chronic depression for like two years, okay, and that's because I totally disempowered myself. I had nowhere to live. I mean, I could have gone and stayed in a homeless hostel, but I didn't really want to. You know what I mean? I had nowhere to live, so I thought I'd do woofing instead. You know what I mean? So I had to have a roof over my head and stuff like that. We have got an economy which is based on excessive consumption and waste. You know, throw away this and throw away that. And pick up a cheap, we'll buy them some more tomorrow. Why don't we learn how to dispose of it properly anyway? The first six months of the bubble, there were quite a lot of people who were quite loudmouthed about their own opinions. It was very difficult to get any consensus at all. The consensus arose when reality kicked in in the winter when it was getting cold and it was wet and there were fewer people about then, the high of reality. I think it was just about the 14th or 13th of February and the weather forecast had said that England was going to have a hurricane at midday and it did. I was told afterwards that a lot of people thought I'd be absolutely mortified seeing my house destroyed with a big tree like this. To me it was a big joke actually. <laughs> and. Uh, 
For the first week, you know, it was how many buckets and how many dustbins we could get out to catch the water because it was pouring in. You know, I was, I was lucky that I had friends here who said, OK, Mike, we'll do your house then. <laughs> we'll get that tree off your roof. We have uh, a number of solar panels which we get our electric from. And for fuel, we use wood. And obviously we have, living in the woodland, we, we source it from there. So it's all, it's all on site. And that heats us and that's how we cook each day on. Where we are situated as well, we're in the middle of the wood. You know, if, if trees need processing, if, you know, it, it's all there in front of us. But I guess it's the grouping of people. I think it's a really strong, a strong bond with people, and there's a strong work ethic. And so, when it's when the group's feeling positive, then you get a lot more done. I think there is a tendency for people outside the community to judge us a little, I think it's in people's nature and a lot of people don't understand what we're doing or why we're doing it. It seems so alien to people who've lived for uh, industrial progress and for money all their lives and we're turning around saying, well actually we don't need all these possessions, we don't need all these things that you've been working towards. I think some people find that challenging. Quite interesting somebody asked me not a member of the community but somebody else asked me how long am i going to be here i mean I've, I've come here to be here forever you know what i mean i don't come here and think oh i'm going to have to be a couple of years and i'll buzz off you know what i mean i think you have to have that commitment to it you know and it's and it's pretty hardcore up here you know it's quite it can be really cold i mean i haven't sorted my house out yet but you know i'm sleeping i'm sleeping my sleeping bag with my duvet on top and i'm sort of sleeping out on as well but you know it's okay, you just moment you get through it, don't you? I wanted to work on the land in a way that that was very strongly part of the seasons. You become so attached to nature. You can't you can't separate yourself out. And we have to understand that we're we're part of everything that's going on around us. We can't separate ourselves off. So that, that really marries with living in a very simple outdoors way. I want to always be one door away from the weather, you know, not not hidden away from it, and and being part of the seasons in that way. I have a family, and I I want my my son to be raised understanding those principles, and to be skilled to to survive in that way. When you go to school, you're told to share things. You know, there's only one computer or two computers, and everyone has it at a time. Somewhere along the educational line, you're, you're actually told to compete with each other, and you're not allowed to share anything. And we're not in a society where sharing is seen as paramount. But that's sort of my theory now, is that the, a lot of these hills were made for some reason. I, I love these hills.